광명성 사모 이호기 위성 발사 성공. Many people don't know that the Korean War of the 1950s technically still hasn't ended, as the two sides only signed an armistice, as opposed to the typical ceasefire or surrender that was especially commonplace not long after the end of World War II. Just how long do you think this peace is going to last? Every president since Eisenhower has had to deal with North Korea in some way, with the Northern Korea being at its peak during the time of the Cold War. Since, they've sort of been on their own, with China providing support. Because of that, they've had to negotiate aid from countries to make up for what they lost when the Soviet Union fell. Soviet Union? I thought you guys broke up. That's what we wanted you to think. So a lot of their behavior was viewed as an attempt to build up leverage to be used to negotiate aid. As in, we'll stop building X weapons for Y amounts of food. The newest leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, has heightened those tensions, as he's felt that the lack of nuclear weapons were the reason that other leaders like Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi ended up being overthrown. Add Donald Trump into that mix, and it looks like war with North Korea could happen at any moment. Accidentally. The United States has the most advanced and powerful military in the history of the world. Despite that, though, a lot of the parts of the military are in desperate need of an upgrade. Nowhere is this more true than the Navy, which has a lot of older ships still in service and a group of men that have had to deal with budget cuts by lowering their standards in terms of not only how jobs are done, but how people are trained for those jobs. It's those cuts, or rather the consequences of those cuts. This ship is 70 years old. It's totally outdated that were blamed for two incidences in 2017, where naval vessels crashed into merchant vessels near China. The Navy is thought of and promoted as this technologically advanced tip of the spear that can locate a Russian submarine 500 miles away or that has gigantic ships that can turn on a dime. The fact that these ships couldn't even locate a cargo ship showed that the Navy is either overworked or in desperate need of some new tech, or probably both. And that's not the best situation to be in when those ships, or ships like them, are about as close to North Korean waters as is possible. We take you back to glorious Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Should those ships cross that line, they'll be shelled by thousands of mortars and perhaps start World War III. So knowing what the Navy is capable of or not capable of is actually pretty terrifying. Liking this list so far? Click that subscribe button and hit that notification bell so you never miss a video. Now let's take this thought experiment a bit deeper. False flag. Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep recently starred in a movie called The Post, in which they reenacted the leak of the Pentagon Papers through the Washington Post. No, I'm, I'm just the postman. Those papers were basically a historical record of how the Vietnam War really began, and what it showed was that the United States essentially lied about northern Vietnam attacking their Navy vessels in what is now referred to as the Gulf of Tonkin incident. They essentially created a scenario that justified the beginning of hostilities in Vietnam, and that's something that could very easily happen again in North Korea. With tensions high and the U.S. bringing a lot of their Navy vessels into the region, the exact same thing could happen again, and we wouldn't be any the wiser as North Korea would most definitely claim that the U.S. started the hostilities and the U.S. would claim the opposite. North Korea reportedly has tens of thousands of mortars aimed at South Korea, from its capital in Seoul to the islands that lie between North and South to the sea itself. Soldier, the only way to learn anything is to do it. Now fire the weapon. One false move could potentially lead to something devastating and with a lot of lies to go along with it. Trump acts like Trump. Things are looking up in terms of North Korea's relationship with the world, as the formerly reclusive leader of the Hermit Kingdom had a historic sit-down with the leader of South Korea recently. However, there is another looming and potentially, literally, earth-shattering meeting on the horizon, and that's the agreed-to sit-down between Kim Jong-un and the President of the United States, Donald Trump. While that sounds a lot like the beginning to a 2012 novel about the end of the world, it's going to happen. You'd think that even Trump's most hawkish advisors would tell Trump to take it easy on Kim, since he's basically already agreed to a lot of the things that Trump, or at least the United States, has wanted. And thus, if Trump just gets Kim to continue to agree to stop the missile and nuclear bomb testing that North Korea has been conducting, it'll be a huge win for a president that's in dire need of one. But this is a president who has literally thrown out the script given to him. Plus, now we have John Bolton in the mix, Trump's new national security advisor, who seems to be looking for yet another war for the United States to get embroiled in. It's thought that Kim wanted nukes because he saw other despots like Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi get overthrown because they didn't have a nuclear deterrent. 
In one hour, it will initiate a massive nuclear attack on its enemy. And now that he has them, he feels like he can focus on other things, like the economy of his country, to avoid getting overthrown organically by his own people, and reducing the crushing economic sanctions that the world has placed on his country. But if Trump demands that Kim eliminate the small amount of nukes that North Korea has, things could turn south quick, which would be really bad for the South of Korea. So stay tuned, as this really is the most likely scenario that'll lead to war. Exploratory Talks it's safe to say that the situation in North Korea is both complicated and rife with negative possibilities and outcomes. As this list will show, a lot of the more reasonable approaches seem impossible, and that's why a lot of people in the know seem terrified that the risk of full-on nuclear war is near, or at least the outbreak of World War III. At the push of a button. Right when all seemed lost, out of the blue, it was announced that President Trump had agreed to a tentative sit-down with the leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. While that seems terrifying based on the temperamental personalities that each have, hopefully the translators can act as a buffer and will be able to calm each side down. Either way, exploratory talks are the beginning of one of the engagement theories, in which each side begins to feel the other out in the hopes that they'll eventually come to one of the solutions listed beyond this entry. But they could also end up engaged in some some of the starts to all-out war that are also listed later. Typically, exploratory talks don't begin with the two men in charge sitting down together, but that seems to be the case here, which means that the United States is one sentence away from nuclear war or World War III, and the person who is capable of speaking that sentence is Donald Trump. While people will make fun of that, it's actually pretty terrifying. The good news is that Kim Jong-un is living the dream in North Korea. I'm just living the dream. <laughs> and doesn't actually want to die or lose his power and way of life, so we've got that going for us in this nightmare that even two years ago seemed like a what if. Freeze for freeze. When it comes to the precarious situation in North Korea, it seems that there are two countries that are sort of in the middle of things, Russia and China. That's a really easy way to explain a pretty complicated situation, but they are at least attempting to become the deal brokers in a situation where it looks like both the United States and North Korea basically hate one another. You were the chosen one! I hate you! They've been pushing a freeze-for-freeze freeze deal in which both sides, the sides being North Korea and the United States and South Korea, will both give up on their military activities in the region. That won't happen, though, as the United States dominates the South China Sea and wants to ensure that it can maintain that dominance, lest China continue to expand on its burgeoning empire. Told you it was complicated. That'd require North Korea to give up both its missiles and nuclear programs, while the U.S. and South Korea would stop with their military exercises in the region. But either way, it's getting little traction from either side and seems like something that won't happen. Sorry. Won't happen again, okay? okay? Even though it's probably the most reasonable next step, which should show you how backwards this entire situation is. Back to basics. Sadly, this seems like the least likely answer to a situation that's clearly reached peak levels since President Trump took office. A few years ago, we were close to having some sort of dialogue with North Korea, with the six party talks that started to make progress around the time that President Obama took office. The history here is that North Korea pulled out of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 2003, which began attempts to create six party talks between North Korea, South Korea, the US, Japan, China, and Russia. Find somewhere quiet to talk. You don't give the authors here. The North Koreans pulled out of the six-party talks after the UN condemned a failed satellite launch in 2009, which has created the situation that we've been dealing with since. Those that call for returns to the six-party talks may be hoping for a miracle, as Trump and his tweets seem uninterested in doing so. What? This is... Boring. He has made demands for North Korea to stop its nuclear and missile development programs as a condition, and that's just not going to happen. So if you're ranking these options in some sort of doomsday fantasy league at your workplace, I'd put this toward the bottom, and probably invest in some sort of shelter, or at least stock up on canned goods. Increasing economic pressure. North Korea is called the Hermit Kingdom for a reason, as it's the most economically isolated country on Earth. In this day and age of globalization, it says something that North Korea has limited trade partners, official or otherwise. And that's based on decades of sanctions thanks to the world powers that North Korea has been battling with since the Kim regime rose to power. I am God. 
There are some that say we should simply keep increasing those sanctions, forcing North Korea to the bargaining table by limiting its already limited access to goods and services, both from the internal and external point of view. The problem with that is that it's hard to enforce, as satellite images have recently shown Russian and Chinese ships trading with North Korean ships. Which brings up the main problem, China. I didn't know you spoke Chinese. So where'd you learn? For any of this to work, we'd both need China to participate officially and unofficially, as they have said in the past that they condemn actions by the North Koreans, but have seemingly kept trading with them, as they fear a humanitarian crisis on their border. The other problem is that this hasn't seemed to work in the past, so there's that. Decapitation there's another theory that may seem like the obvious choice, but because of the nature of how things work in North Korea, it could end up creating endless chaos, both in North Korea itself as well as for its neighbor to the west, China. That theory is called decapitation and talks about killing Kim Jong-un, allowing the people, in theory, of North Korea to be free of the cult of personality that has dominated the country for decades. If they move, kill them. It's been reported that the South Koreans have a special unit in their military whose sole purpose is infiltrating their way into Kim Jong-un's palace and taking him out, SEAL Team 6 style. The South recently promoted this as a bargaining chip to hopefully get the North Koreans to the bargaining table, but it didn't work, at least not immediately. Kim is one of the best guarded human beings in the world and has been far more successful at assassinating those that could challenge his power, like his older brother, than anyone has been at murdering him. Kill him. <laughs> And who's to say that taking him out would make anything better? There are nearly 26 million people that live in North Korea. And as we've seen in Iraq and Libya, killing dictators doesn't always make things better. With the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to say the world would be a lot better if both Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi were still in power, human rights abuses notwithstanding. Forceful containment, the bloody nose method. Hey, you, you gotta, yeah. There are those, some of which are currently in charge of the United States government and military, that believe that the previous regimes in the US and elsewhere have been too soft on North Korea and have allowed a bad problem to escalate to a terrible problem. They may have a point, as it appears that North Korea has ignored all of the sanctions directed its way, and that those sanctions also may have bolstered the regime's claims of being mistreated to its people. Those people believe that the time for talking is over, especially because the North Koreans don't really do what they say anyway, and that a time for limited military action has begun. That's the crux of forceful containment, an idea that a limited strike on small targets could show North Korea that the United States and its allies mean business. As a real estate business. Excuse me? The problem behind this idea is obvious. North Korea could see this as an overt act of war and could respond appropriately, which would escalate to an out-and-out -out war between the US, South Korea, and North Korea, and potentially China and Russia, and there you go, World War III. This shows just how precarious the situation is and why it's been such a hard nut to crack. This has been called the bloody nose option and has been debated feverishly by people who debate those sorts of things. But luckily, at least for now, it seems that Trump has either decided against it or has had enough pushback from his generals to not have done it. Preventative strike. What do you mean? Kill him. What? Kill them all. President Trump has given his opponents a lot of sound bites to make fun of him, or to define him, and there was perhaps no better example of this than the fire and fury line he repeated to reporters while meeting with his military advisors not long into his presidency. That's an actual strategy, though, as Trump was using the same bellicose language toward the North Koreans that they were using against him, and also implying, remember, shock and awe? Well, wait until you see this. Fire and fury would be the first part of a preventative option that was later laid out by previous U.S. National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster. The general idea is that the United States would initiate a war with North Korea before they have the ability or option to use any of their weapons against the U.S. or its allies. You can fly this thing? Yeah, I can figure it out. You got your warplane. Let's go to war. And in the process, they'd lay waste to most of the military infrastructure, and otherwise, in North Korea. This hammer would lay waste to most of North Korea, and because a lot of it lies underground, it would take a tremendous amount of firepower, which means also killing a lot of civilians. That's one big negative. The others being that North Korea has been preparing for this very thing for decades and has over 8,000 big guns aimed at Seoul, South Korea, one of the largest cities in the world. Also, no first strike would completely disable the North Koreans, meaning they'd still be able to respond. So before you hop on into your bunker, click that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. And hey, why not check out some of our other videos while you're here?